Hi everybody! It's us again from the City Museum. I'm Nico, Alyssa's on the camera, and Mindy has joined us for moral support. We are definitely keeping our six feet distance just to be safe, but we are here outside on this beautiful sunny day in Juneau at St. Nicholas uh, Russian Orthodox Church. So we're going to be taking a look inside. Uh, Father Simeon has been gracious enough to let us come visit to really talk about an ex one of the most iconic and recognizable uh, buildings here in Juneau. Tourists know it, locals love it, and we're going to take a look behind the scenes. Hello everybody, a team here from the City Museum back at you. We are here in St. Nicholas Church up on 5th Street and we are here with Father Simeon. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having us, we appreciate it. And we're actually inside the church, which I'm sure pretty much every Junoite can recognize and pretty much anyone who's ever visited Juno is going to recognize this building. It's incredibly iconic and absolutely beautiful. So I wanted to ask Father Simeon if you wouldn't mind giving us a little bit of background on the history of the building. The background of the history of the building, it's actually very interesting. This is the oldest church building in Southeast Alaska that we have discovered. And this is the last of the octagon-shaped buildings left in Alaska at all. I mean, this building was constructed in 1893 and 1894 uh, at the initiative of Chief Yisganalach, uh, who took the name uh, Dimitri in baptism. He donated the land for this building and the church school that actually used to sit just over here. Uh, as well. That, that's been closed since 1917 after the Bolshevik Revolution. But he donated the land and the first priests to sign here, um, all the way through Father Andrew Kashavarov, all were required to be not just speak Russian and English, but they also had to be Klingit speakers. So all of those early priests spoke in Klingit. The intention here was not to force everyone to become Russian, to force everyone to become English and other than what they were, but the instruction was, we are here to teach orthodoxy to the people in the native languages. And this was, as most of us remember at the time, anyone who studied the era was quite controversial. Uh, we couldn't pray in, you had to pray in English was the argument between Sheldon Jackson and many of the Russians at the time. This was even happening in 1893 when the Russians were sending their material. And this particular church has something very unique. I don't know if I'm going to walk out of the frame here or not, but on this door here, uh, which is called the deacon's doors, this one and the one on this side, traditionally the icons on those two doors are either the archangels Gabriel and Michael or the deacons Stephen and Lawrence. In Juno, and this is the only church in the world that has this, in Juno we have St. Methodius and over here is St. Cyril. Now if you'll notice he's carrying a scroll with the Cyrillic alphabet which they, from where they get their name. And the Russian Mission Society when they gave us and commissioned this icon screen and had all of these original six icons painted for us, chose to put St. Cyril and Methodius on there. Kind of was just the Orthodox Church's answer. We had this debate, and we had this debate a thousand years ago in the 900s when Cyril and Methodius, two Greek missionaries from Thessalonica, went to about modern Moravia, um, modern, or Mar the Moravian mission, about modern Slovakia, and began to evangelize the Slavic peoples. And rather than saying, well, you have to worship in Greek, Hebrew, or Latin, they said, you need to worship in your own language, but you don't have a written language, so we're going to have to invent a written language, and hence the Cyrillic alphabet. But this actually became a very important piece um, of the Russian mission from the time it first began to spread, the Russian mission's focus was not to make everybody be Slavs or make everybody be Russians, but to translate the local languages uh, into the Yakuts of Siberia, the Aleuts here, the Yupik, Klingit, all of the native languages were expected to be used in local worship. Which is my understanding one of the main reasons why Russian Orthodoxy spread 
and was accepted and held on to for so long here in Alaska. Very much so. Uh, very, very much so. It spread, uh, the Aleuts began to convert um, during the Russian colonial era. I mean, you know, Kodiak in their territory it was there. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing to look at is that most of the Yupik people and most of the Kingit people did not convert until the 1880s and 1890s. And as we remember from our Russian history, Alaska was sold to the United States in 1867. So this was not the normal colonial approach where you, know, you have to become this if you're going to advance in the colonial authorities. This was people accepting what was still termed a foreign uh, religion and still looked at very much in the 1890s and the early 20th century as, you know, this is a foreign religion. Those Greeks and those Slurbs and those Slovaks, they all, it's all funny. It's not the way we do it. But that became the point where the Klingit accepted, particularly down here, the, the, the oral history is that the Klingit accepted orthodoxy here for a couple of reasons. They were encountering all of this pressure. The, the traditional native spirituality was kind of collapsing in the face of the modern world. The, as Father Michael Alexa likes to put it, when an oral literate, when a literate culture encounters an oral culture, there's always a lot of difficulty. Uh, and this is anywhere you find it, with, whether it's Chinese, whether it's English, whether it's anywhere you find. And this traditional spiritual life begins to not make exactly the same sense. And the people were looking for a new answers. And as they were looking, a lot of elders began to receive a vision of a little bald-haired man in very bright clothing telling him to follow the Russian way. Well, Chief Dimitri at one point, this is the history, this is, was related to me by Nora Dauenhauer, uh, bless her soul, I miss her greatly. Uh, but she said, you know, as they were converting, when Chief Dimitri sent his son down to meet uh, Bishop Nicholas uh, Zayirov in San Francisco, uh, it was the predecessor to Tikhon of Moscow, who would later become patriarch, but he sent him down there to begin to explore this Russian way, and the elders were having these visions and having these visions. And Bishop Nikolai baptized Chief Dimitri's son, and please forgive me, I'm drawing a blank on the name uh, right now. He baptized him, but he came back up, he was given some gifts. Among the gifts was, a, was an icon of Saint Nicholas. And so as he's presenting his findings and the results of this meeting with uh, Bishop Nikolai in San Francisco, he shares the icon, and the elders start grabbing the icon. This is the man I've been seeing in my vision. This is the man I've been seeing in my vision. That is why you'll find that you know this parish and Huna are both named Saint Nicholas. The original church in Angun was actually built in Kilisnu. Uh, that was uh, Father uh, Yuan Sobolev was the pastor there for many many years. But the original church there was named for Saint Andrew the First Call, mostly because when they also petitioned to have Saint Nicholas because of this vision. Bishop Nikolai Zirov said, well, that's three St. Nicholas's in one deanery. That's too many places for the deans and the priests to travel on feast days uh, if you all can't travel and visit. So we'll let you be St. Andrew the Apostle. Now that church, uh, Kilis New Church, burned in 1929, and the parish ended up rebuilding in Angoon uh, with St. John the Baptist. Well, one last question while we still have you here. Of course. Um, what is the reason for the octagonal shape of the church itself? There are multiple ways. The octagon, this was just kind of a village church, uh, but it's a circle. You know, ah. the, the Orthodox churches are either made in the form of a cross, an arc, or in this case, a circle. Because this, the dome of heaven, because if you look at the sky around us, the skies around us are a dome. So this church is kind of representing a circle at this particular point, and the high roof was very much a Russian adaptation, because um, it kind of snows a lot in the north of Russia. And you know, they discovered when they first built the earliest uh, buildings in Kiev, middle, medieval Kievan Rus, which is the root culture of both modern Russia, uh, modern Belarus, and modern Ukraine, they built the Greek style domes and the snow was causing them to collapse. So they started building the cap dome, the onion dome, and then eventually the tent roof like this which allowed snow to shed. That's 
Perfect. And then um, my understanding is that the screen is from Russia. The screen is from Russia. The, the, the screen and the icons are original. Mm -hmm. uh, th these were shipped uh, along with the architectural plans in 1893. Um, this actually is the first hand cross. Uh, it's, we bring it out every year at the Exaltation of the Cross the, in September and then in the third week of Lent. But this blessing cross, which would have lived on the altar, is the original. Um, this seven branch candle stand, which you can see another one, a smaller one on the altar, is also original shipment, as well as this processional cross right here in the altar. These are all original shipments, items, and we are in the process of uh, full restoration. Uh, we are working with the Russian Orthodox sacred sites in Alaska. We have restored uh, the bell tower um, because that was collapsing in 2005, so it sat up the hill. Those of you from Juneau will probably remember that. It sat up the hill for a bit until we could literally reconstruct the inside, pull the roof off, uh, and construct outside a steel infrastructure to support the bell and lift it back in and reconstruct the roof. Uh, the next phase then was to redo the foundation here, which has been completed. The final phase is we have to have a mechanical room to install um, fire suppression system. The same, uh, Rocio wants to put the same one with Monticello, but that is gonna involve a complete reconstruction of the old rectory uh, where we put our gift shop next in the summers next door. It's gonna be reconstructed backed up, the basement will house the mechanical room, and the front entrance facing the street will actually be restored to the oldest photographs uh, back in the 1890s where the door is facing the street rather than off the side of it is now. So this is where we're beginning the fundraising. Um, so if you have desire to donate, please contact, contact us at the church through our website. And Thank you guys very much for coming. Is there any more questions you have for us? I don't think so. I think the one last thing I wanted to note was even though you have these uh, amazing pieces of art and uh, of religious importance that came here from Russia, the church itself, my understanding, was built with all local materials. It was built by local workers, um, both uh, local Klinkit and then uh, Serbian, Serbian miners. Yes. So yeah. at a time when there actually weren't Russians here in Juneau in the early 1890s. So it's a very unique place, not only from a religious perspective, but from a city perspective. So we just wanted to really highlight such a unique place. And thank you so much for letting us come in here. And thank you very much for coming. Thank Have you. A wonderful we'll afternoon. see you all later.